Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Awesome. So we're seeing your slides. That's good. All right, uh, I see maybe some of us will come later. Let's get started. Welcome can everyone. Get me? Sorry, yeah. can you give me one minute? My cat is trying to claw through my door. I will be right All right. Back. Sorry. Sure. Meanwhile, we get more participants, good. Well, while the cat problem is being solved, do we have any announcements? Uh, Liam, let us know when you are ready to start. I'm ready now. I just All right. I tried so, to distract her from attacking the door, but I could not, good. so we'll do our best. It's better right. than to come here and interfere with your talk. Yeah. Um, so welcome everyone. Liam will present his first year experience. He will talk for about 30, 40 minutes, then we'll have a discussion. So go ahead, Liam. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today I will be presenting my first year research experience and I'm a member of Dr. Asaf Harel's lab and um, I don't see him in the chat right now, but he might join later depending on his availability. He's in Israel right now, so there's a, a huge time difference. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to give some oops, I wanted to give some personal background because it's probably many of you um, have not actually met me in person. So I work in the human neuroscience and visual cognition lab. I'm a second year. Uh, human factors student, and my research interests include uh, cognitive neuroscience, neuroergonomics, neuroarchitecture, and virtual reality. And I include and more because I feel like as every every other paper, I find something new and fascinating that really interested me uh, when coming to grad school. And I'm sure by the end of my uh, time here, this research interest list will be Three times as long. <laughs> All right. So today, um, I'm going to give a review of the literature needed to understand uh, the topics that I'll be talking about today. I'll be talking about um, what the first year project was going to be for me and our goals with the project, as well as our research plan and progress, so how the research has been going and future directions, and then a uh, closing slide. So what is neuroergonomics? So if you've taken ergonomics um, already, this term is probably familiar to you, or if you've looked into this before. So neuroergonomics is about understanding the brain in its wild environment. It's looking at 
real world tasks and everyday life contexts and looking at how the brain reacts to um, the body and the environment and all its relationship to all these things. So previous research in neuroergonomics has investigated the different ways that one's surrounding environment can impact their cognitive ability. This is referred to as neuroarchitecture. So neuroarchitecture is a combination of neuroergonomics and architecture, and it's studying the insights from the brain while people are presented certain environments and applying this information to design built spaces. So it's looking at brain activity and how we react to their different environments, and then trying to replicate the ideal cognitive state or what brain activity you want to see in other built spaces. So a neat idea, but it's pretty difficult uh, to do. And it's relatively new, but we'll talk about some of the ways that they're making it happen. So within the field of neuroarchitecture, there's this general research, or researchers are generally interested in this thing called psychedelic design or natural like design and figuring out how can we incorporate patterns in nature into architecture to influence one's cognitive state. I'm sure we've all uh, been in an environment that was filled with plants or had a very, had a view of nature and felt much happier and much better in that environment compared to uh, maybe like a closed in office with no windows. And so uh, it's a, kind of this idea. They're looking at how we can take natural scenes um, and put them into built spaces and replicate the patterns found in nature. As it has been shown, when you can do this, it improves mood, reduces stress, um, and enhances overall well being. This isn't just cognitive effects, you can actually see it and uh, physiological effects as well. So, studies have investigated how, or studies have shown how patients who are hospitalized who have access to views of nature, so maybe they have a window that has. Um, a natural scene or a park in the background, those patients actually experience reduced uh, hospitalization times and require less pain medication. There's also um, been research, how do we take this phenomenon of these effects from viewing a natural environment? Can we make this, can we get these effects when presenting something that's artificial or in artificial natural scenes? And they have found that images and virtual representations of nature can induce um, similar benefits, um, not to the exact extent of getting to view a whole park, but it has been shown to help. And so the interest here is uh, psychologists are trying to figure out the perceptual mechanisms that are causing this sort of response. And some suggest that this is in part due to fractal patterns found in nature. So you might be thinking fractals. <laughs> Didn't expect to talk about that. Well, fractals are actually um, a big interest in neuroarchitecture research. So fractals are not just the kaleidoscope that you had as a kid. Uh, fractals can be found all over the world. They're self-similar patterns over a range of magnification. So you see on the left here is um, a view of some clouds and their fractal pattern. And you see the bottom left, it's lightning striking. The middle image is um, a view of uh, mountains and mountain ranges. And then on the right is um, salt farms. And I want to pause real, real quick. Is this recording by chance? I just want to make sure. Yes, it is. Okay, that's good. I just I couldn't see the indication that it was, so I wanted to make sure. Otherwise, that would be bad. <laughs> so yeah, thanks right. for asking. Mm -hmm. So fractals are found not only in the natural world, but they're also found or in the earth, they're also found in biology. So we see fractal patterns in biology, such as um, the branches of trees or in the veins of leaves. We also see uh, fractal patterns in our own biology. So our lungs um, have a similar pattern. If you picture the image of the lungs upside down to kind of looking like trees. And that's because um, fractals, this isn't going to be a biology presentation, but fractals maximize surface area. Um, and so if you're trying to have a, get a lot of surface area in a compact space, 
um, a fractal pattern is a way to achieve that. And then that uh, top middle photo is a picture of uh, funky looking broccoli. It's not an alien, uh, it's a real food. Can't remember at the exact um, moment, but if you type in fractal cauliflower or fractal broccoli, it'll come up. I do want to try it one day, but <laughs> besides that. So how do we actually measure the complexity of fractals? So fractal complexity, um, is denoted as D. It can be measured by the degree to which an edge pattern in an image repeats. Oh, is there captions going on? I don't know if I have captions turned on. I, I, I see them on. I don't know if everyone sees them. Well, I'm sure we can agree it's bad for peripheral vision, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't didn't know that they were being captured. It says that the host is controlling this and I can't turn it off. Oh, I'm you not want seeing me, any. You want me to turn them off? Well, at is least allow what? us the discretion of having them on or off. Well, I can turn them off. I don't know how to to allow you the discretion. Well, I can turn them on and off, but Right now, it's saying that the host of the meeting is controlling this, and I can't turn it on or off. If you I don't see them at all. So you don't see them? No. <laughs> so okay. Just you can try turning them off because it may happen. I did. I'll try again. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Some something just switched, and I, it says I, I turned them off. Okay. So now everyone should be able to turn them on or off at their discretion. Sorry. I'm so. <laughs> I'm it's all right. So. I, I didn't even realize it was happening. I can't. I wasn't looking up my annotations. That would be distracting for me, especially. <laughs> so fractal complexity um, is denoted as D. It can be measured by the degree to which edge patterns in an image repeat. And this ranges, uh, this complexity ranges from one to two. So one would be a relatively smooth line versus two would be a completely filled in area. And so complexity increases as the amount of fine structure in the fractal pattern increases. So on the right here, we see um, two different fractal patterns. Uh, the left one is an artificial tree, which is made through mathematics. And on the right is a real tree. And you can see how the complexity of the fractal pattern remains the same. It doesn't look exactly the same as in the mathematical one or the artificial one, but the fractal complexity remains the same despite um, the zooming out of the image. And so nature is filled with these sort of mid complexity fractals. And those are considered between the ranges of 1.3 to 1.5. Um, others say 1.4 to 1.6. But we'll just go 1.3 to 1.5 for today. And they found that um, when people are presented these different um, dimensionalities, people have a strong preference for mid complexity fractals. They've also looked into the brain's response to viewing these, and it, um, people tend to show an alpha wave brain response indicating uh, wakefully relax. So here are a few more um, examples of fractals in nature. On the top here, you see the low dimensionality. So you see a tree line while the leaves are still all filled in. But come the winter, uh, or in a few months, uh, will the leaves will drop. And so the, the complexity in the fine edges of the skyline increases and you see a higher fractal dimensionality. On the right is two examples of how the sky can have different dimensionalities. On the top one, it's relatively low, soft, and smooth, just clouds. But when looking through tree branches, um, it becomes a much more complex and chaotic um, scene. So there's been investigations into why is there this sort of preference for mid-complexity fractals? Why do people tend to prefer this sort of range? And the thought here is called the fractal fluency theory. 
So this theory suggests that our visual system has evolved to efficiently process mid complexity fractals due to their prevalence in nature. Um, studies have investigated this when viewing fractals, um, eye trajectories may mimic the mid complexity fractals, no matter what fractal complexity. So if you see here on the right, um, the bottom right, there is this figure indicating um, in a person's gaze or their traje eye trajectories as they look at the object. And the red line is indicating where they're looking. But as you see in this table, um, you see on the left, the dimensionality of the image. So it goes from 1.1 to 1.9, so relatively smooth to more complex. And then the saccades are um, on the right. And you notice that the matter, the dimensionality, it's always 1.5, 1.6. So the fractal fluency theory was looking at these findings and suggesting that maybe the reason that we prefer these sort of uh, mid-complexity fractals is because that is the way our eyes naturally move, no matter the fractal complexity. And they have discussed how a fractal search is potentially advantageous when exploring a natural terrain and foraging, um, either looking for when effortlessly looking throughout a scene. But when a non-fractal element is detected, that effortless looking switches to uh, a focused attention. So when friend, foe, or food is detected um, out in the landscape, you attend to it versus before it's more effortless. And that's when um, your eyes are moving this sort of fractal pattern. So that's the theory behind why we have this sort of um, preference for mid-complexity. They've also looked at how this can be then applied to computer generated fractals. And does this still hold up? And researchers have found um, that you can find similar findings um, when generating computer or computer when creating computer generated fractals. So past experiments investigated the impact. And there's this, they found a huge preference from preferred for fractal patterns compared to non-fractal patterns. So when um, asked to give preference between either these rectangles or stripes compared to fractals, people preferred to view fractals. And the highest average visual preference was for uh, fractals of mid complexity, which is the ranges of 1.3 to 1.5. And you can see here how the complexity of the fractal ranges from 1.1 to 1.7. In 1.1, the lines are relatively smooth versus as we move to the right, it's more chaotic and more um, fine lines. And so that's the characterization of a higher dimensionality. So if we know that there are benefits to mid-complexity fractals, either artificial ones, um, or we know there's benefits to natural environments, natural environments are typically characterized by mid-complexity fractals. And there's a preference for fractals, these fractals, why don't we see more of them? Well, we actually do see um, a lot of fractals in architecture and art. So on the left here, um, image A, the left image A, uh, you see an example of the Eiffel Tower, where it, the fractals not only serve for the beauty of it, but it's also for function, for holding the tower up. We also see it in the land or in the silhouettes or in the designs of interiors of different temples and um, churches of the past, as well as in older architecture. But here in the center, you see actually a Jackson Pollock painting, um, number 14. And this is characterized as having a fractal dimensionality of 1.4. There's actually a group of researchers that are very interested in looking at how his paintings uh, correspond to different fractal dimensionalities on different periods of his life. And it's a whole interesting um, subtopic. We're not gonna talk too much about that, but if you're interested, I'd be happy to share um, information and papers on that. But I bring up these examples because fractals have been incorporated to art and architecture in the past for function and beauty. And there's interest in if we can control the dimensionality of the fractal, can we use it to influence certain cognitive states? theoretically.
And so we, there is evidence that there is a cognitive benefit to viewing these sort of natural scenes, even if they're artificially created ones, as they reduce stress, improve mood, and general cognitive well-being. There is increased visual interest in fractal designs compared to non-fractal design, designs. And there's also a preference for uh, mid-complexity patterns. So this is all what we've talked about. And there's this preference both in the way that our eyes move um, when doing a fractal search or scanning an environment, and then in the behavioral ratings. So this leads us to our project. So now we've covered the background. What are our goals with my first year research experience? So the goals of our project were to investigate the impact of fractal dimensionality in built environments. We wanted to design and implement a Qualtrics survey to collect behavioral ratings because we started um, this project in fall of 2020. So we still weren't allowed to do any EEG or in-person research. And so this was our best use of our time. And what we're hoping with this is that will create a potential baseline for future EEG experiments. And we can validate um, the images that we have and trim down the amount of stimuli that we have for future experiments because we have a lot of different stimuli. And so we're hoping that with this project, we can get an idea of what to expect and what can, we can remove and what we can keep for future um, experiments. So personally, I wanted to learn how uh, visual scene perception or architecture research, I wanted to learn about it, which is, I covered some of that in the past couple slides. I wanted to become familiar with implementing the basic uh, research processes. I've had research experience before coming into grad school, but it was in a much different lab. It was in um, working with mice models, completely different stuff. And so I wanted a fresh start with all this. And then also to collect, I wanted to collect data that can potentially be used to supplement a potential thesis project, at least get experience working with data, again, real data. So our study is titled Behavioral Judgments of Built Environments. It's currently on Qualtrics um, as of Sunday, and it's investigating the relationship between low, medium, and high fractal dimensionality as well as looking at shallow, medium, and deep application of the fractal patterns. So there's nine dimensions, and participants are being asked to rate um, the image on six different continuums. Beauty, interest, valence, relaxation, approachability, and explorability. And we took these questions from other research that has investigated the neurological and psychological responses to built environments. And we chose the ones that they found to be the most useful to find the most different um, sort of constructs and what we agreed on with our collaborators. So there are nine dimensions, six questions, and 30 exemplars, which leads to a total of 1,620 image question pairings, which leads to a very, very large survey. We'll talk about how we worked around this. So past research suggests that, or as it, sorry to mention, that image on the right here is one of the examples of the built environments. And you'll see many more as we go through the rest of these slides. So past research suggests that images with mid-level fractal complexity will be preferred over high and low level complexity. It also suggests that ratings of relaxation and calmness will decrease as um, the fractal dimensionality increases. So low fractal dimensionality images, those that are less complex per se, should have stronger feelings of relaxation and calmness, while those that are more complex are likely to induce feelings of stress. And so we wanted to avoid confounds um, when creating these stimuli, which is part of the reason why we have so many. So you'll see just a brief few of them today, a, a brief amount of them, but they all come in varying colors, uh, different depths, meaning that the pattern, the fractal pattern is either the deepest part, the middle, or just a very shallow level of the image. Uh, the actual pattern of the fractal, the furniture orientation within this environment and where the empty spaces are. We also wanted to make sure that the 
participants were viewing the full beauty or taking the full image. And so this survey was only on non-mobile devices, meaning not laptop or not tablets or phones, but just um, com computers and um, laptops. So on the right here, you see an example of what it would look like for one of the questions. You have the image in the middle and then a scale on the bottom. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But first, I wanted to talk about uh, the methodology behind this. Of course, Asaf and I did not do this alone. Uh, we need, we're working on a multidisciplinary uh, team with this. The images were first designed by Dr. Jordi So. She's uh, from the School of Architecture and Interior Design at the University of Cincinnati. Then, once we had these images, um, Dr. Steen Peterson here at Wright State University, who's a professor of mathematics and statistics, he analyzed these and we then categorized them into the different groups. Now, where Asaf and I come in is we are helping implement the survey and then collecting the behavioral data. We're providing the psychological and neurological cornerstones to this project and hoping to, once we collect this data in this project, we'll then take it to EEG and fMRI potentially. Still have to talk about that. So it's a multidisciplinary team um, and it's fun to learn about so many different things, but I've also learned it's very challenging because then there's so many different papers, but really enjoyed this so far. So now talking about more of what Asaf and I did. So we mentioned how there were so many different um, question items pairings. So we wanted to make sure that participants could move through the survey as quickly as they needed to. Um, and so we split it, but we still had to split it into two different surveys. Um, so survey A has an, um, one through 15, exemplars, and then um, 16 through 30 is in survey B. Both have an equal amount of the things that we're trying to control for our confounds. So we shouldn't see too big of differences. The order of which the different dimensions is presented is randomized. So a participant will be presented a randomized exemplar of any of the dimensions, and then followed by six questions. So it's not randomized exemplar, random question, and then another random one, it's just an exemplar, and then it asks them the six questions. And these questions, like I mentioned earlier, were sampled from past research. So the way we designed the Qualtrics survey is that um, as soon as they click on any of the ratings at the bottom, it immediately pulls up the next question so they don't have to waste time scrolling, and then they can always be viewing the image that they are rating, because that was something that our um, architect colleague wanted to make sure that they were always viewing the image when rating the question, uh, when rating it rather than scrolling and providing ratings to something they're not looking at. So the questions like I mentioned here, here's another um, exemplar. So you have your six questions. Um, first one is always rating it from one to seven, the space looks ugly to beautiful. Then it's asking boring to interesting, stress to relax, ignore it to explore it, and so forth. So I wanted um, to take a moment from giving lecture and actually getting some audience participation, potentially. So here are nine of the different images. And I was gonna ask you guys three questions. And if you, you don't have to talk, you can just type in the chat, but I was curious. Which one of these nine images do you guys find most beautiful? All right. I'm seeing a lot of ones and a lot of nines, a lot of, I think a few fives. Maybe that's just because I just looked at it. All right. So I'll put something in the chat now to divide it. So I'm going to ask another question. So which one of these environments would you prefer to explore the most? So which one's most interesting per se?
you guys seem to really like one and five, <laughs> or at least on this diagonal, the one, five, and nine. All right. And the last question is, pulls up, which one of these makes you feel stressed? Personally, for me, I'm I'm tied between two and five. Five is just very abstract to me. And I feel like if I was sitting in that environment, I would feel way more stressed giving this presentation than I am at home. <laughs> so just thought it would be interesting to see what you guys uh, thought of these. I'll now reveal what their dimensions were. So I mentioned that we were looking at the three levels of dimensionality, as well as the depth or of the pattern applied to the space. So you see here in the top left one, that was number one. This one had both high dimensionality, so it's very visually complex, and it's the application of the fractal is all the way throughout the image. Compared to the shallow version, of the high dimensionality, only the backdrop is a fractal the rest of it um, while it's a high dimensionality fractal it's not um the it's not all the way in depth it's shallow application i think it would be very interesting to see a building either like um number one so that's high dimensionality or deep at the medium dimensionality and deep or the high dimensionality and shallow because they just reminded me of right state colors i didn't design it the architect did but it'd be cool to see what students prefer those buildings. Anyways, just a fun little activity. Um, and I would, there are many, many more of these images I would show you, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the complete data set. But so individuals who are taking these um, surveys are looking at each of these images on um, 30 exemplars for each combination here and rating them. But we have the survey split in two, so it's only 15 at a time, but it's still quite a bit, and they're seeing quite a bit of different fractal spaces. So this study just went live. Um, this was a long time coming, um, partially because when working in a multidisciplinary team, um, things can, communication is slower than when it's just you and your advisor, and um, everyone has different opinions on different projects. And so this data collection has only started um, started this past Sunday. And so as of last night, uh, we had 30 responses, um, each for the two surveys. I think 29 and 30, but it's increased already today. And so I don't have any official data to give because it, I still need to um, account or collect more data um, and check for insufficient effort responding before any final conclusions can draw be drawn. But I did look into some trends to see what we can see already. So um, as predicted earlier, we talked about how higher dimensionality images are likely to be associated with stronger ratings of stress or lower feelings of re relaxation. So I took the average of all these ratings um, and divided them between the different factors. So if you see this blue one here, it's 3.37. Um, the scale was asking them from how does this building, how does this space make you feel from a scale of one being stressed to seven being relaxed? And you see compared to the high dimensionality compared to the low dimensionality, uh, the high dimensionality is lower. We still need to collect data and I need to test for um, statistical significance and all this. So it's just done uh, this morning because I wanted to, you know, I was excited to see what data was coming in. But I also wanted to check to see, does depth actually impact the sort of rating for this? Um, we didn't expect it to. It was one of the compounds that we were trying to account for. And we, there is a slight difference, but I don't suspect that it's significant. And so, I would love to update you guys um, later as I, we continue to get 
more data and analyze this. There is uh, looking at how these different depths and dimensions um, impact different ratings, all these questions. I think it will be very interesting. And I'm especially excited for the next couple of steps that we hope to take, which I'll talk about now. Quick question. Sure. Lower numbers mean uh, higher stress? Yes. And then okay. higher, uh, the higher value um, would be relaxation. So low on the Likert scale of one to seven, the one would be stressed, seven would be more relaxed, and then the middle would be neutral. Thank you. So it's not saying that the low is super um, relaxing, but it just shows we expected that higher dimensionality would be associated with stronger ratings of stress. But of course, we need to get a lot more data, do a lot more thorough analysis or analyses, um, rather than just the 30 minutes before the presentation that I had to look at this. But that will come in time as we get more data. So where can we take this? And um, this is what most excited about is because we can once we analyze well we need to analyze the behavioral data and then adjust the survey as needed survey is pretty long and we're the purpose of this is also to validate the items and see are these different items getting the information that we want once we work to adjust it um, we then want to incorporate it into eeg so previous research has indicated some of the brain regions that we'd expect to be related to these constructs of interest, which is why we picked the specific questions um, that we did. And then lastly, if all goes well, uh, it would be, I think it'd be really cool to replicate this study in virtual reality. So this past summer, I got a chance to work with the Air Force Base to design a virtual reality um, simulation. So I spent all summer learning how to code in Unity and design a virtual environment and collect data within it. And so I already have a template for all these things. And now I think it'd be super cool if we could put these complex environments within a virtual reality space, because it would be pretty hard um, if we actually tried to build all these things and then um, get ratings. And we think it would be interesting to see how a person would respond to seeing these environments and actually being able to explore them in a virtual reality simulation compared to just viewing them in a survey. So that's a future avenue that I think would be interesting. And potential implications of this. Um, so some people have actually started using these sort of patterns. So they're um, or using fractal patterns to influence people's moods. So if our findings support the previous uh, literature, it would support the idea that architects and interior designers can implement these sort of fractal patterns to influence the cognitive states of the viewers and inhabitants. And there's actually a group in Canada, I believe, that's looking to do that through carpet patterns. It's, co it's called the Mohawk Group. They make relaxing floors, as they call it. And they have various different designs uh, that are all fractals that are within the mid complexity range. And they're hoping that these patterns will have a good or a positive impact on um, the viewers or the inhabitants mental state. If we also find uh, support with this project, we still have to do more research. Um, it should, I think it'd be interesting to see how VR simulations of these virtual environments could impact cognitive state and if that could potentially be used in a way to plan out um, buildings. So you could see how different fractal potential layouts would impact someone and record brain activity, and then to decide to build whatever they expected or whatever they're looking for. We are a long ways away from that, That's, um, but it is something that's interesting to me and I hope to work towards it eventually. But of course, more research is still needed. So I would like to conclude um, by thanking uh, my collaborators, uh, Jock Dujuri Sa, for her help with all these images and um, helping me understand the architecture literature. Uh, Dr. Steen Peterson for all his help with actually analyzing the fractal dimensionality of these images. And of course, Asaf 
for mentoring me and guiding me and introducing me to this topic that I would have never known about had um, I never, um, never started this project. And lastly, thank you all for attending and listening to my talk. Um, I will close it now and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Any questions? Hi, Liam. I have a quick question. Um, any idea what the uh, psychological explanation might be for why people prefer the medium fractal complexity? Sure. That goes back to uh, the fractal fluency theory. I'm going to jump through some slides. Sorry. Um, pretty far back. <laughs> All right, so the fractal fluency theory actually, I believe, is also based off of um, an attention theory. It doesn't, can't, I was looking at it this morning, it doesn't come to mind right now, but it's talking about how these mid complexity uh, fractals are, we're able to effortlessly view them, or to say, as they don't really demand a lot of attention, as it is the way our eyes move. I am by no ways an expert, and I need to touch up on this subject again. But my suspicion is that we have this preference for it. And the reason it has maybe less of a demand is because if our eyes really do move in this sort of pattern um, and we've evolved to be in this environment, when experiencing these, these would be less um, cognitively taxing. So. so why would it be less uh, cognitively taxing than low complexity? So do you mean as in uh, a low complexity fractal? Why is that one? Why would that one be more cognitively taxing? Yeah, why mid complexity would be the least taxing? My suspicion is that it would be because our eyes already naturally move in the way or the eye saccades or trajectories are mimicking mid complexity fractals. So if we have to, um, adjust in some sort of way to make up for the difference, maybe that would have um, some sort of cognitive tax. Beyond that, I'm not quite sure, but I would be happy to look more into it and let you know what I can find. Thanks. Hi, Liam, this is Scott. I have, I can even start my video. <clears throat> I can, uh, I, I have a question and it's related to, to, uh, to, to sort of what you were just talking about. And I completely understand if you don't know the answer to this, because it, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper. And you just mentioned that you have to touch up on the eye tracking stuff. But the, <clears throat> the image that you're showing in this slide of the eye scan patterns is a, um, a static image that had been collected over some period of time. Do you know when assessing sort of the <coughs> um, the fractal <coughs> characteristics of this scan pattern? Um, my guess is it's being done on this, you know, static image that has been that has sort of evolved over time. And so the question really is, um, since this is evolving over time. The eye, the, the saccade trajectories only, you know, have this fractal complexity after they've done. That is, uh, that that sort of analysis doesn't take into account the, the time scale at, at which this pattern is being generated. And so, if, for example, you looked at a time scale, you know, of a second, it, it probably doesn't have that fractal, that fractal characteristic. And so, uh, uh, just something to be thinking about is if I'm assessing something that's happened over, let's say, uh, a minute and say, oh, look, my eyes, they, they move like fractals. Well, that, that can be misleading because that's the only the pattern after you move your eyes a whole bunch and, um, and at a, 
at a smaller time scale, it, it, they may not have any kind of fractal kind of characteristic. And, and that's just something to think about in terms of how do you interpret that particular um, you know, analysis result. Yeah, uh, I believe the image was static. Um, I can check again the literature. We talked mainly about doing or incorporating eye tracking into this once we get to the EEG step. Um, yeah. Because since we're limited to doing a Qualtrics survey with this, can't really collect eye tracking data. So we're hoping that this is just a step along the way to then being able to see does the eye tracking replicate or is it what we would expect to find with these previous findings of it? Yeah, <clears throat> again, I just think you have to be careful because there's a time dimension that gets completely lost in that kind of analysis. And um, what I think is sort of important because it is, um, so one question is, is the fractal pattern of eye movements uh, sort of a, an epiphenomenon having overlapped this this long time period of eye movements and and um, and if I just <clears throat> if I took a computer and had it make random random excursions on uh, you know that where I added some had some random uh, made some random let's say uh, it's going to make a it's going to it's going to simply make random line segments one after another and they're all linked together and i randomize you know how long those segments are and what and what orientation they have and i just let the computer generate an image what it and then you analyze the fractal characteristic if you got something like you get with the uh, eye scan patterns then then what does that say? It says, oh, I can get I can get mid complexity fractal images from a random process. And that would certainly I don't know if that would be true or not, but I think it's an interesting thing to try because that would certainly impact how I, for example, would interpret this because if if <clears throat> uh, because I, you know, I scans are really just that they're just they're they're line segments that have are linked together because I'm being generated by my eye. My eye is moving different distances, different directions. And uh, and if a random walk in that in those dimensions gives you a medium complexity fractal pattern, then it says that there isn't anything um, there's anything like pre-planned or, or or somehow about uh, the eye movements that makes it mid complexity. It's just even a random pat, a random walk will do that, and that sort of changes. That should change the way you interpret what it means that you got that kind of fractal com complexity. Yeah, I think these are all very interesting points. I, I'm, I'm very excited to actually get to to do this in person so that we can start actually investigating uh, these sort of things because there is a lot more to look at and to before you just say that you're getting this effect from an image that has this pattern on it. So I definitely think that it is something that I'm happy to look more into. It's not something that I'm too familiar with. We were talking about, yeah, we were talking about eye tracking last yeah. fall and then we realized that it's going to be a year <laughs> until we can do yeah. eye tracking. And so he's like, okay, let's see what else we can work on in the meantime. Right. But right. it is something because I was looking into how um, different VR headsets can check eye tracking because I was interested in like, well, could that be a, could that be used to track eye tracking versus just normal and um, an eye tracking setup? Right. But can't really record eye tracking data, right. of course, on a Qualtrics right. survey that you're not, yeah, that yeah. people are taking remotely, but I would be interested right. in exploring um, the things that you talked about here. Yeah, do you, do you have you, uh, do you know how to do the fractal analysis or is that completely in the hands of uh, uh, the person from math and stats? That is, he did all of it. Um, 
uh, Dr. Peterson did, yeah. I would definitely, I do plan to um, ask him about this because if I want to continue this sort of research, I think it's important that I understand uh, more of the processes behind it. Um, at this yeah. stage, he is taking care of it because there is right. so many things to juggle here with um, getting the <laughs> images. Oh yeah, no, completely understand. Um, but I'm sure he would be interested in um, continuing this work. Uh, some, I was checking his page right. today and he this still is doing a lot of fractal work. So I assume he'd likely want to do more. Right. You, you should also know um, uh, Dr. Chris Barton in, um, in the environmental sciences, uh, he, I think he still does. He teaches a class on chaos theory and which is, you know, revolves around fractal analysis. And so he is very much into this kind of analysis too. So that would be just another resource person for you. Thank you. I'll look hey, into uh, some of his work later today. So Thank you. I have a question about the, the effect that you are observing and not necessarily yours, but from the literature. Uh, can you say something about the effect size? So what's the typical effect size in this and whether this effect survives habituation? So, you know, let's assume that the carpet makes me less stressed. Uh, is that at first encounter with a particular carpet and uh, how, how much it reduces my stress? Is it a significant reduction in stress and does it last? Um, yeah, I, I think there has back? been mixed results on those findings and that's why you're not seeing fractals put up everywhere to just um, reduce everyone's stress and improve everyone's well-being because then, you know, we'll just put mid-complexity fractals on every single wall and the world will be safe. Um, I think there is, there still needs to be a lot of research done to look at what sort of effect size uh, you see, and especially with different patterns and in, in different places. Um, we haven't gotten to get to that step um, yet. And a lot of these examples that I mentioned today are implementing fractals in different ways. They're typically done in just um, single research studies. So I haven't studied, or I haven't come across the literature for the Mohawk group, that implication for the, the fractal floors I talked about in the past, but I think it's worth looking, as I keep saying, I think it's worth looking into a bit. So I'm sorry, I don't have the exact data on what they have found, but the majority of these studies are just looking at, at single instances. But for the hospital, um, for the one that I was talking about hospitalization, that was with a window and it, that was throughout their entire stay at the hospital. So it wasn't just, they were shown a room <laughs> with a window once and then took it away, taken away. Like, okay, well, you know, it's cut in half now because you saw it outside. It's not, that one was continuous, but these other ones, um, some of these other findings are not set up that way. So I, I think that is an, it's important to then see how long should someone spend in this environment? How long does the effect actually last? Thank you. Other questions? Well, if we don't have other questions, we can stop here. Oh, um, let me see. There is something in the chat. Can you read it, Liam? Yes, I see it now. I'm reading it. Potentially. Um, so the question is, does this have implications for industrial design for something like fast food to get um, people to leave more hastily versus something like keeping um, them around in a space uh, to relax and purchase? I think it could definitely be applied. And that is part of the reason why um, these sort of built environments that we created are could simulate something that you could drop in a food court, or you could, this is the architect's idea, or you could drop uh, in a library or set it in different places. 
And um, it would be interesting to see when we find these layouts, could those which layouts that maybe have a more calming and relaxing feeling could be placed in like maybe a coffee shop or a place that you would want someone to feel more relaxed versus in other places where you want someone to actually explore an area and spend more time in it, what sort of fractal dimensionalities and what things promote that sort of feeling. So I think it does um, definitely have an implication for it. And I am curious to see once we have our findings, which ones people prefer for or have experienced these different feelings around. So I think there definitely is a potential implication for it. Um, it's just not exploited yet to my knowledge. Maybe they are subtly doing it already. And we just haven't noticed, but to my knowledge now, there is an implication though. So this question reminds me of the idea of choice architecture, which kind of sounds similar to your idea of uh, neuro architecture. So the idea of choice architecture was promoted by uh, Richard Taylor, who got the Nobel Prize in economics in 2017. And he promoted this idea of nudges, which is to structure the environment in such a way so as to help people make the decisions that they would want to make. Um, but for various reasons, they, they couldn't. For example, you can structure the food in a cafeteria so that the healthy food is at the eye level, for example. Um, yeah, so I believe it might be the same Richard Taylor that I have here, actually. Um, he was He's also looked go. into uh, the sort of biophilic fractal design, uh, these two last citations. Oh, he's not Taylor, so it's Taylor. Oh. H-A-L-E-R. Yeah. Oh, I was like, that. that's pretty close for pretty similar ideas, but right. I just misheard you, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, similar ideas, but in different domains though. Yeah, both, so it's Richard Thaler. Yes, one. I, okay. I can send you the reference if you want. I would appreciate that, thank you. All right, um, any other questions? Let's see anything else in the chat. So we can finally stop it here. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Liam, and I'll see you next Friday. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye. -bye.